Yo, 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 what's up, people? Welcome back to another episode on Jason Guna TV. Remember, if you're here for the first time, don't be shy, people. Subscribe to the channel. If you love talking football, you love breaking down football, this is the channel that you will enjoy. Yes. So we just want to bless up everybody um, for subscribing to the channel so far. Massive growth of the channel. We're really, really thankful. Um, definitely, um, you know, a lot of YouTubers in the space definitely showing me definite respect and everything. Anytime I show up in the chats, they're letting the people know that we have started a channel. And of course, people, we're going to let it just keep growing and growing and growing and going from strength to strength. So um, as we say, as you see in the title, people, today we're going to be discussing the first leg of the UCL Champions League matches. Um, yeah, two classic matches I thought yesterday, Arsenal and Bayern, Real Madrid and Manchester City both ending in draws and both had their share of controversy. I would say a little more controversy definitely in the Arsenal um, Bayern game, which we'll definitely talk about as well. And the Real Madrid City game was just more two teams playing an incredible brand and style of football and both having, you know, punching each other in the mouth and recovering, counter-punching each other. So really, really good advert for European football yesterday. Um, also, we had a couple of reggae boys in midweek action, namely mainly in the English football leagues. So we had the Championship League one uh, going on as well and some, some games in League two as well. And of course, in the title, we also have the CONCACAF U20 Championships draw, which will be tomorrow, uh, 11 o'clock Eastern, 10 o'clock in Jamaica, um, where we will find out what it's going to look like as far as the groups for the under-20 championships as we try to qualify for the U20 World Cup coming up there in July. So we're just going to touch on that briefly and also dive into if, you know, that team will be well prepared going into that tournament and what it's looking like on the administrative side for that tournament and what that is looking like. So we're going to discuss that, people, but as I said, people, little UEFA Champions League breakdown, uh, the two matches, definitely going to check on some of the reggae boys in action, see who's playing today as well, and definitely going to touch a bit on the U20 draw for tomorrow. So first and foremost, people, let's big up who is in the building. So fresh God, bless up, bless up, bless up, Sean. Respect, bro, for being here. Like the video, let them know. 433 Press up, bless up, bless up, bro. Been viewing the content, liking the stuff, bro. Keep it coming. Definitely like the, the content and stuff. Um, Yeah, man, let them know, Sean. Dance all topic up, you know. We out, we out, we out. Yeah, man. And Ty said, up, go now, up, Ty. Yeah, so we, 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 we're just going to, as I said, people, we're just going to break down some of the football from yesterday at first, so. Let's go ahead and do what we normally do, which is put some statistics on the screen and we'll break down what we thought about the match. So first and foremost, I am going to get the Arsenal versus Bayern team sheets up and we're going to go through the statistics and everything for the game and just discuss in general how the game went in my eyes. So um, let me get this going here. Tycoon said one Barca. Yep. PSG, Barca, big game later. Yeah, man, definitely going to talk about the two games today as well before we move on to the reggae boys. So first things first. Yeah, man, Pressa, been taking the mean, man. Like the content, man. Like the content. Like that you have a, a different take to most, you know. You have your own mind. That's good. Don't follow people, you know. Yeah, man, so. This is what we have here, people. This was the lineups for the starting lineups for yesterday. Uh, Pagan, bless up, bless up, bless up, bro. Make the people them know, share the, share the thing, make them know we're live. Different time for me. Normally, it's a nighttime thing, but had some time in the day today. So I'm going to go ahead and give the people some content and definitely been, been wanting to talk about these two matches anyway. So, yeah, as you can see on screen, people, um, this is the arsenal Bayern Munich match. So, as you can see on the right-hand side of the screen, Bayern Munich went with the 4-2-3-1 system. They had Neuer in goal. Kimmich, Delict, Dyer, and Davies on the back line. Goretzka and Conrad Leimer in midfield. Sane, Musiala, Nabri, and Harry Kane up front. And for Arsenal, we went with the 4-3-3 system. Um, David Raya in goal. Kivior left back. 
Magales, Saliba, and Benjamin White on the back line. Declan Rice, Jorginho, and Martin Odegaard in midfield. And up front, he went with Arteta went with Kai Havertz and Bukayo Saka on the right and Gabriel Martinelli on the left. So basically how this how this kind of looked on pitch. Um when Bayern Munich was defending, I would say it kind of morphed into more of like a 4-4-2, where they had um, Musiala and Kane kind of pushed up, um, you know, trying to basically put a press on the central defenders, but they didn't really press them that high. They really kind of sat as cover for the two pivots in midfield, which were Declan Rice and Jorginho. Um, ben White was really pushed high up the pitch, so that was kind of driving Gnabry back. And Davies was playing man-to-man -man and Saka pretty much for the most of the first half. Um, on that left-hand side, you know, they pretty much were conceding that wing to Kivior as Sane kind of was tucked in to kind of help to support, to block uh, Declan Rice on that side to build the play. And Martinelli was kind of dropping a bit deeper as well. And Kimmich was kind of staying pretty close to him. So, you know, they, they really didn't want the, the, the wing-backs to are the our wingers to be able to go at their full backs too much so they didn't want them to get started so they pretty much were man to man on the wingers and they trusted that the 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 Sanes and Gnabry's of the world would watch the Ben Whites and the Kivior's of the world now of course as i said Kivior really never pushed up he kind of stayed into a back 3 when we had possession and Benjamin White was at times the furthest forward on the right uh due to the fact that Davies was playing man to man on Saka and, and was following Saka everywhere in the pitch. So if Saka was here, you know, dropped into the midfield here, Davies would follow him. And there was a lot of space over here for Ben White to use, which um for the second for the when it was one nil for Arsenal, I remember Ben White had a chance in that area, tucked inside and had a one-on-one -on -one with Neuer, and he shot it straight to him. So um I think tactically Arteta had a decent plan as far as when we were in possession. Now, where I think the issues lied was when we did lose possession because of the posture that they took, um, because Kivior wasn't really a threat going forward. Sane was up the pitch. Kane was up the pitch. And at most times, Musiala was up the pitch because, as I said, he was kind of... Kane and Musiala were ending up shadowing Rice and Jorginho, who were, you know, definitely somewhere closer to midfield even when we are in possession. So it was nothing for Musiala, Kane, and Sane to be breaking the other way on the counter, definitely, at least from the half line. And they were ending up getting some three-on-threes with Kivior, Magales, and Saliba that was causing us issues. And, um, yeah, I think, you know, it was a nice tactical battle in the first half, especially I thought that Bayern Munich pretty much gave us spaces on the pitch that they thought we couldn't hurt them, which was Kivior getting space, you know, Tactically, we weren't willing to have Kivior push up the pitch. And it wasn't going to be something that they were really worried about. They were going to take their chances with that. Um, and they just wanted to make sure that Saka, especially, you know, never really had much space. But funny enough, the first goal did come from Saka. And I think it was just a lapse on the part of Davies, really, because the initial defending was okay. But the ball squirted back out to um, Ben White on the wing. And he just played a quick pass in field to Saka who had lost Davis for a split second. And Saka smartly just let the ball run past him um, and had the perfect setup for the far post curl because there were three defenders in, in the line, or two defenders in the line of sight of Neuer, and so he couldn't really see it. And once you put that ball outside that far post and curl it back in, unless the goalkeeper just guesses and tries to dive before the shot is taken, there's really no way he's going to stop it if you if you execute it right. So it was 1-0 to, to Arsenal really on, I thought, a mental lapse by Davies and maybe a bit of, you know, timid defending by Dyer, who I thought could have cut the angle better, um, just kind of stood still and froze, which I think made it a little easier for Saka to shape the finish into the far corner to make it 1-0. Um, then on that 1-0, as I said, there was a big chance for Benjamin White down the right side, basically from a play where... Saka had dropped in field and deep and Davis followed him all the way in there and left that large space for, for Benjamin White, who, who had kind of lost the eyesight of Gnabry, who was, a, who was a bit focused on the ball. And when that through pass was played, as long as he was onside, which he was barely onside, he had a lot of space to just take a touch towards Naya. But 
Um, the shot, while well struck, went straight to Naya, who positioned himself well. But that that play there was a big, big play, a turning point, I thought, because, you know, we were in the ascendancy at the time. I think we, at that time, we didn't really see the big threat from Sane just yet. And I thought if we could just keep our, our foot down in that moment when the fans were really up for it and get that second goal, it could have been different moving forward. But... He wasn't able to finish that chance, and soon thereafter, um, there was a long ball played. And you know, in the initial action, you know, Gabriel is gonna comfortably win the ball from the forward, but he looks back to see if he can play it back to Raya, and Raya is actually coming towards him to clear it. So that mix up causes him to kind of have a little bit of panic. He pushes it a little bit to the wide side of the field, and in st- I thought once Raya saw him take that touch, he did a good job to retreat. And would have been able to get the pass then. But I think, you know, Gabriel just had his mind made up that he wasn't going to still pass back to Raya. And he tried to play a no-look pass infield to Kivior, who I thought could have reacted a bit better to the pass, if we're being totally honest. He was a bit flat-footed and the ball ended up getting by him. I believe it fell to um, Limer, I want to say it was, at that time. And... When Limer picks up the ball, of course, Gabriel Magales is out of position on the left. Kivior is pushed up, trying to receive that pass in midfield. Declan Rice was smart enough to start dropping back. But in the build-up of the goal that Gnabry ends up scoring, I think Declan Rice makes a huge mistake. Um, And I think the only person that I saw talk about this was um, Thierry Henry, who I think is brilliant in punditry. But he said that in that moment when Rice assumes that center of the back three because Magalhães is all the way to the left and Saliba is wide right as well based on how the play developed. He just needs to sit there and form a nice back three. But what he does, he gets sucked upfield back to his you know defensive midfield position and pretty much Goretzka makes an intelligent run behind the sight of him and Rice doesn't realize until it's too late when the pass is played. He's in behind, and then a brilliant pass by Goretzka, who sees Gnabry making the diagonal run across the box, and Gnabry, with a good sliding finish that Raya isn't able to keep out, hits off his leg and ricochets into the goal to make it one all. So at that point, um, you know, I was starting to not panic, but it definitely reminded me of some goals of the Arsenal of you know, five, six seasons ago in terms of the mix-up in the back that allowed that goal. So, yeah, that was that was something that definitely scared me. And then, um, you know, about 14 minutes later in the 32nd... There is rock. And there is southern rock. There are lawns and there are southern lawns. Cool. We'll get rid of that, people. Sorry about that. Um, but yeah, it was at that point, it was one all. Then, of course, Bayern Munich were able to get a penalty. And the way all this play developed was kind of crazy. So when we were pressing them, it was pretty clear that we wanted Dyer to get the ball from Noya. And we were pretty much blocking the passes to everyone else. And once Dyer got it, Odegaard would trigger the press and we would press him. And he would either go along or kind of, you know, just not make the right decision. But Noya did everything, did everything to, um, you know, try not to give Dyer the ball after a few plays. And on the goal build-up, he actually ends up scooping the ball over Havertz, who's blocking the pass to Delict. And then from that build, Delict finds uh, Sane, who spins Kivior on the half line crazily. I mean, just completely twists him up gets by him and then makes a run from the half line all the way into my, um, basically onto the penalty spot. And, you know, I think Jorginho is the only player who gets a touch on it, but he can only push it into Sane's path. Um, Sane does a good job freezing Gabriel Magales, who, you know, wants the challenge, but knows he's in the box, so kind of pulls out. And then Saliba does not pull out, tries to win the ball, and he ends up taking out the the player's legs for the for the for, for the penalty, which was a good call. Which was a good call. Um, you know, can't really go around it. I thought the referee made the right call on that penalty, 
And of course, Harry Kane steps up at the Emirates for a penalty. As long as he's not wearing the England jersey um, or is the Champions League final or anything, he's probably going to score the penalty. So uh, I thought Raya definitely went down way too early. But, you know, Kane doesn't normally have that run up. So it was clever on his part to kind of change his run up a little bit and go ahead and get that in on target to make it 2 1. So at this point now, all the texts and the things start coming in battle job, Arsenal, you know. Arsenal strikes again. Everybody's saying that pretty much we're heading to the dreaded 10 nil as my virgin JD who just forward. Big up people, man's busy fighting his car. Okay. So we we'll soon get the big bad streams from the new spaceship that's being purchased by JD. So we we'll soon see that. We so say we escaped the normal 10 nil. There was nothing normal about it. It happened maybe once or twice. So don't don't overdo it. <laughs> but yeah. Um so yeah, that penalty people made it 2-1. And at that point, um, I think Arsenal kind of just wanted to get to halftime. I don't remember us really creating anything after that 2-1. I think it was a bit of shell shock for the rest of the half. Um, luckily, though, we didn't really give up many chances to them either before halftime. So we kept it 2-1. And, you know, I'm thinking the coach would have to do something in this second half to change the tide. Now, I was thinking that he was going to bring on Tommy Asu for Kivior because I thought it was clear that you know, it was just a bad matchup for Kivior as far as Sane and his direct style of play and his trickiness and everything overall. So um, he didn't go for that, though. He actually went to try to, um, you know, change the flow of the game by bringing on Zinchenko for Kivior, which completely changed the way that uh, Bayern Munich was set out to defend. Because, of course, and let me, let me kind of demonstrate this by pulling up back the team sheet, people. Um, you know, I remember as, as we're finding this and pulling it back up, people remember to like the video, share the content, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Um, and we're going to go ahead and pull up this because what I want to show you people is the difference of how I thought that the, the change in tactic of bringing on Zinchenko, how it helped to kind of stem the tide as far as, um, Bayern's counter-attack is concerned. Because I thought it kind of where in the first half, Sane had the freedom to pretty much be wherever he wanted on the pitch. Um, you know, when they were defending, he could kind of stay a bit higher on the pitch. Once Zinchenko came on and his role was to invert into midfield and kind of get the legs more in, get the numbers more in our favor in midfield then I think that's what made a big difference in Sane's role in the second half, where I think apart from an early run into the box in the first, in the second half, um, Sane was a bit more quiet in that second half compared to the first. So, um, so yeah, let me, let me pull up this, people, because I want to show you something on screen. Um, why I thought... why I thought that this change at halftime was crucial. So Kivior came off and Zinchenko was the one that came on. But what that did, people, was, you know, pretty much for the most part, Arsenal will try to keep a somewhat of a back three shape regardless. Um, and I thought in the second half, while we didn't create as much down the right side as we did in the first, because Ben White wasn't bombing up the field as much, and he kind of tucked in a bit more as the third center back when we were attacking. I thought that the introduction of Kivior, what that did for our attack was um, Zinchenko would become the sole CDM pretty much right here. And it made Odegaard no longer have to drop so deep to start the play. And he was getting it in a lot more dangerous pockets of space because if we got outnumbered in that CDM space, Jorginho and Rice or one or the other would drop and make that two in that CDM space to beat the press. And then we could get um, Saka on the ball. No, excuse me, not Saka. We could get Odegaard on the ball more in these areas of the pitch. Whereas I thought in the first half, he was limited to getting it out here and building the play. I thought that the introduction of Zinchenko basically pushed Odegaard into a more CAM role which I thought made us more dangerous in attacking-wise. Um, the one thing I didn't love about the system at times was 
I would have wanted maybe Jorginho to be a bit more attacking and Rice to be the one to accompany Zinchenko because I did think that when they did break at times, we were vulnerable still on the counter-attack because it was Zinchenko and Jorginho kind of closest to the back line when I think Declan Rice would have been better suited to be one of those people. Um, and I didn't really think that Rice was that effective attacking-wise yesterday either. So that was the one thing tactically I thought I would have tweaked if I was... Um, if I was Arteta, I would have found a way to have Declan Rice a little deeper in the system because I do think it helps to prevent the transition at times of the other team if we have him kind of closer to the back line on the transition phase. But um, let's see, Brent, Brent forward and said, we're learning in the job. And Brent said, we're going to shock the world with the win in Germany. Boy, that is my hope as well, Brent. Yeah, man, Owen, Owen, morning, morning, morning. We're out. We're outside. You know, different time for we. Blessings, Miss Claudia. Glad you're in the building to discuss some football. Remember to like the video while you're here. And stick around if you can. Drew Ross, bless up, you know. Yeah, man, respect for being here, bro. It's a discuss the ball game, you know. Two classic matches yesterday. Up, up. Tycoon, bless up. JD. All right. So, yeah, people. So I thought that was a masterstroke on the part of Arteta because I think it definitely changed the tide of the game um, in terms of that second half. You know, as you can see in the attack momentum, you know, we did have the better of it for the most part in the first half in terms of momentum. But I do think that when they attacked us, you could see that their threat might have been even stronger. Um, whereas in the second half, I thought that our attack, even though we didn't have as... You know, it was more even in terms of when they got into our attacking areas. Um, I liked our attacks more in the second half. How we were building the play, how we were getting in, how we were combining. I thought it was a little bit better than in the first half when I thought at times it got a bit stagnant. Um, so, yeah, you know, I, I thought I tell two halves. I thought you saw the difference of when Zinchenko is kind of that playmaker quarterback in that role. Um you know, so Jorginho is very good at it as well, but I, I do think he does that, that role better when he has a partner with him. And in the first half, you know, I, I feel like Declan Rice maybe didn't sit in that CDM role enough for me. He was pushed a little bit too far forward sometimes. And it was Odegaard that was the one that was having to drop deep, which, you know, I, I don't care where Odegaard has the ball because he's that good. But I know for a fact that he's more effective if we can get him the ball you know, up the pitch to kind of combine with the attackers. So it was a tough one. It was a tough one. Um, yeah. So basically people, you know, that, that to me changed the tide, but I do think that what really put it over the top for us yesterday was the introductions of um, Trussard and Jesus with this double substitution. So they dropped Georgina from the pitch, which as I said before, dropped um, Declan Rice deeper in the system. So when, Zinchenko inverted. It was him and Rice kind of as the CDMs. And then you had Havertz dropping out of that, um, you know, false nine role. Jesus going into it and Havertz dropping back into midfield. So where those oppositions, you know, the attacking phase on the left where Rice was picking up the ball and I thought not being that effective, it was now Havertz there who provides a much greater threat when he was combining with Trussard on that side. So, um, yeah, I thought that, I thought that they definitely um they definitely made a huge difference and they were the ones that ended up creating the goal actually in the 76 minute um of course Jesus picked up a ball on the basically you know this in this area here on the right hand side drove towards the box faked a shot sat someone down and typically after that initial chop sometimes we really cuss Jesus about his decision making what he does next but I thought he definitely surveyed everything and laid it off to Trussard with the right weight so Trussard didn't have to take a touch and the finish was sublime right into the bottom corner of course you know if you're going to beat a keeper of Neuer's quality it's going to have to be in the corner so two good shots on the day for Arsenal to get their goals I thought Trussard um, you know other than that was also a threat 
in, in other phases of play as well. Um, I remember he had like one bad touch by the wing, which I was like surprised by. But other than that, I thought him and Jesus played really well. I thought Jesus actually played a little better than him, to be honest, even though uh, Trussard got the goal. But Jesus was pretty much looked really, really sharp when he came on, just picking up the ball in those pockets. And, you know, I think Kai Havertz, um, while I think in some aspects he's better in the position because maybe that threat of the direct play that we can have with him because he will flick on the ball, hold up the play really well. But I feel like if, if you can, you know, create that pocket of space to find Jesus at his feet, he'll hold the ball well with it on the ground because his first touch is very good. He knows how to shield the ball. Um, and if he's sharp, if he's in form, um, you know, he's not the easiest to take the ball from him when he's just trying to build play. So, you know, there, I like the fact that we can change it up this season. I think that's one of the biggest differences that's probably going to help us in this title run. Um, you know, while... In certain areas of the pitch, the drop-off might be really great. I feel like in the attacking phases, you know, they're very interchangeable at this point. Martinelli, Trossard, Havertz, Jesus, Saka, um, you know, Smith Rowe can play up there, Fabio Vieira. Maybe those are a little bit lower level, but I feel like the drop-off isn't to the point where they couldn't do a job for us in a game. Um, so I'm really interested to see people this weekend what Arteta does with the team sheet against Villa because I know he'll have one eye on that game Wednesday but can he really afford to do that you know it's the Premier League title race with Liverpool and City and so yeah we're gonna see people we're gonna see but there's some big decisions to come for him but um there are some huge 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 things that happen in this game that I I would be it would be bad of me not to bring them up so um the first one that I have to discuss people is something that I'm not gonna lie I miss this in real time as you know the City game and the Arsenal game were happening simultaneously. I was not in a place where I could have multiple devices going. I really only had one device to look at during both games. So um, I, I did not see this happen in real time during the game at all. And if you, if you don't know what I'm talking about, <clears throat> people, I'm referring to Arsenal having a goal kick, right? And during the goal kick... This is what happened, people. So are you guys seeing this on screen? You should be. Oh, no, you're not. All right. Sorry, people. Let me put this on screen for you. So, yes, people. This this right here. I don't want to share the audio. Okay. So this right here, people. So we're going to play again, people. So the ref blew the whistle. He passes it. Gabriel picks it up with his hand, spots it again, and continues to play. Now, Thomas Tuchel was asked about this. or I don't even know if he was asked about this, but he brought it up in his post-match interview. And he said that the players on the field told him that the referee said that was a kid's mistake and he didn't see it fit to call a penalty for that in the Champions League quarterfinal. Now, people, I'm an Arsenal fan, and JD will tell a bag of lies and say I'm a bias. But this is foolishness, people. This is a stonewall penalty, especially because... Now, I watch Arsenal all the time. So I know that typically the way we start the goal kick is Gabriel passing it to Raya. That's how we always do it. But even still, if Raya heard the whistle and passed it to him, now, one thing I will say, the Arsenal players did an excellent job of having no reaction. Look at Raya. He doesn't even freeze at all. He just acts like it's normal. But, brother, what do you think about this? Isn't this craziness? First of all, the explanation by the referee is a madness. If I'm a Bayern Munich captain or player and him tell me that, I am. that is madness, people. I am the biggest Arsenal fan. You will find. But this is a travesty. This should have been a penalty. And a potential red... Well, maybe not a red card, because I don't think you can get double jeopardy and get the red. But a yellow to Gabriel and a, pen, and a penalty. And a penalty. I saw Kane and Musiala in the wider shot of this running directly to the referee. They not even care about the football again. They must run to the referee. So one of the things people like... 
un, un understand because because I've heard I've heard, I heard I heard some people in some in some discussions that I'm in say that boy great use of common sense by the referee. But I'm telling you, these people, if that was Noya and Dilik doing this, or Noya and Daya doing this, brother, I am fuming. I am, I'm still cussing, still cussing. Unbelievable people. I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe it, bro. So I'm so. I want to say, I got a penalty like that playing under twelve. Yeah, and it's, and basically, Brent, that's why the ref no get the penalty, you know, because the man say it's such a schoolboy thing in can water down the UCL to that but I know I know another another ref fault that happened Arsenal fault because because I'm telling you from watching Arsenal all the time the way them start the build up phase Gabriel they, they pan the side and then pass it to Raya and then go from there but some kind of way I don't know but I believe Ryan wasn't passing it back to him to pick it up because he, even though he never have a reaction, I'm sure in his brain, I wonder, like, what this man do? Yeah, man, that was a robbery, bro. Yeah, he was he was upset. Um, Kane, one thing I can say about Kane, though, he never bring it up in him post-game. But he was upset on the field. He was upset on the field. Penalty. Yeah, man, childish or not penalty. It have to be. A huge bullet dodge, Claudia. Trust me. Huge. Huge common sense, my foot. <laughs> oh, yeah, I talk about Christina, uncle. Oh, yeah, I, I never saw her explanation on that one. If that's what you're talking about, maybe there was a lady on some British media that you were watching, but I saw the I saw the referee analyst on the CBS Sports show. Shout out to them, love that show, Thierry, Micah, Caraga, and Kate Abdo. Um, yeah, they had her come on and discuss the other thing what I'm going to talk about, which is the soccer incident at the end of the game. And I want to see what you guys think about that. But I'm going to do the same on that. I'm going to find a nice clip, bring on screen, and we'll discuss that. So, of course, at the end of the game, people, we had that big play. Um, I think Partey played a through pass, and it was really a bad pass. And it was terrible communication between, I think it was Dyer. And Davies on that left side, and Saka didn't give up on the ball, ran in and was in on goal. Made a good touch around the keeper as well. And then for some reason, decided to what I thought. Uh, well, I won't talk about it yet. Let me let me just show the thing again. I found a, I found a nice clip um, of it when it was slowed down. Nice. Yeah, I think this is it right here. And I think this angle tells a decent story as well. So let me pull this one up on here. Bless up, Jam PL fan. Focusing so much on the pause it somewhere. All right. So, so here. Now, to me, if Noya leg is there the whole play and Saka still kick him, then it's on Saka. But look when I go. Okay, now, now even here, he might still be okay. But by the time he puts his foot on the ground, people. Boy, I land it. All right, this all give me PTSD. I thought for the screen. Yeah, well, to be honest, I'm just ha I was happy that um Coleman isn't fully fit because you know, even though Gap Nabri got the goal, I think if them have Coleman and Sane one time out there, it's really gonna be problems because you know we always have one side to the umbrella shift. So if I'm Bayern Munich, whichever side we're not shifting, I'm going there. You know. But but I'll tell you this. I think in Bayern, the one thing that gives me hope for the for the next game, people. I think the, the, the posture of the game will be different. So Bayern will have the ball more. They'll be attacking us more. I think the win when Bayern looked most dangerous against us was on the counter break. And I don't think we'll have the ball as much in Bayern. So, you know, I like if my defense is set, I think we can handle them 
you know, obviously they're great. They're a good team. They're going to get chances. I'm not saying they won't do anything. But I feel like they'll be hurting us more in possession, not on the counter, which I think is when we're most vulnerable. And actually, I also believe that our counter attack against their defense, remember, they won't have Davis for the second leg. So that's a lot. Of, that's a lot of the reason why um, Saka was kind of under wraps was, you know, Davis is, he just physically can't match him. He can't, he can't just dip his shoulder and beat Davis. It ain't happening, you know. Um, I saw Guerrero come in in the second half on that left side playing an attacking role. But I think he's the, he's the second left back, as, as far as I know unless they play, uh, you know, a right back at left back, which they could, I guess. Um, but regardless, Davis won't play the second leg. So I like the fact that he won't be there on the counter. Um, it will be Dyer, Delict, um, you know, Kimmich, and probably Guerrero, if I had to guess, who won't play left back. And, you know, Kimmich and Guerrero ain't the fastest players. Um, and they'll be pushed up due to them having the ball. So <clears throat> I like our chances on the counter in this match, I think. We might even have even more of an edge in terms of the, um, you know, like the reasons why Bayern look dangerous on us. We you can flip it when we go to Bayern, you know, because they'll have the ball more and we'll be countering when they have less numbers back. So I, I like I like that we'll have those situations that are going to arise in that second leg. So looking forward to it, people. All to play for two all. It's going to be an uphill battle, of course. It's the Alliance Arena, big big history there. Um, you know, but but when I look at the team, um, they have players there that you know this will be a big occasion for them. I mean, you know, Hurricane has this over his head. You know, he can't win anything, any big ones. You know, he can't win anything basically. Um, and you know, basically you, you write them their name on the trophy in, in in Germany every year. And the first year he's there, now they don't win the league. They're behind Leverkusen by like sixteen points. So, you know, um, you know, it's a big game for him to step up. Um, you know, you have the players there, you know, Delict is, is newer at Bayern. Dyer's never, you know, it's his first season at Bayern. Um, Guerrero does have experience from Dortmund in Champions League, so he's very qualified to handle the situation. Kimmich as well. Um, but I do think that Kimmich, especially in a game where, you know, maybe they're not in a defensive shape as much, he's somebody I think we can get dried on that left side. I think Martinelli thrives more with the space in behind, and we'll have that more in the second leg. So that's my hope, people. We're going to hit them on the counter, be a, um, have a better display defensively, more solid, hopefully, because that was one of the weaker defensive displays I thought yesterday. I thought Kane, um, you know, Kane is just a very smart player, uses his strength and his body, um, just puts defenders under pressure, and I thought he made it so uncomfortable for Gabriel and Saliba yesterday um with his smarts dropping deep knowing when to draw fouls knowing when to play through the foul and play the, the, the spring the through pass for the counter you know just intelligent player so as i say tough 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 battle for us next week but <clears throat> first things first we have to get through villa first so one game at a time <clears throat> munich only have this cup to concentrate on all them well rest for next game yeah that that's um you know, that's, you can look at it one way or the other, right? You know, we, we'll, we have a big game this weekend that will keep us kind of focused and up for it, but we'll also be exerting more energy. And I'm sure Bayern Munich going into this game, well, I don't think they have much to play for. I, I think they pretty much will make Champions League. Um, you know, they just can't win the title anymore, basically. So <clears throat> he might rotate the whole 11. Who knows? You know, and just play some kids. I don't know. Um but we'll see how that goes, people. I think both teams will be up for it and ready. I don't think this time of year, you know, unless a man is just totally injured, they're going to play through any kind of stuff they have going on, man. So, you know, it's just that time of year where mind over matter sometimes. They <clears throat> say, if you just want to finish the goal, Yeah, I think the, the guy Dan from AFTV said it, you know, he said it pretty much like this, Demo, like, him doing that, like we should not be cussing the ref or saying it was robbery. We should be looking at the player and, and saying, yo, why didn't you just get the ball and just go score the damn ball? It was deliberate for Nabri and Kane to score. <laughs> Son is special. Pet Badman Black Genetics. Uh, well, let me see. 
I'm signed a kanji, Doku. I believe Ake is a black man. But yeah, yeah, Toure Oberm from the Champions League for years. Sane left at the height of his powers. Um, after the disrespect he kept getting. So yeah, I don't know. Pep is a weird one. I think Pep like black man if them go and make him win. I don't know. I guess he thought that. I know he won with Sane, but I don't know. Maybe he saw he saw the future. He saw that Foden is just better than Sane. Maybe that's what he saw. I'm showing respect, deciding to play us on the counter. Yeah, well, look. I mean, you can't let these mad fans. These it's just Liverpool fans will tell you that playing on the counter is rubbish, you know. Because they're 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 one of the few teams that just play heavy metal all out all the while. But that's why that's why them concede as well. You know? They're under pressure because of their domestic season. Yeah, look, I said this um to somebody yesterday when I was having a discussion that while I'm fearful of this game because it's on the road and it's Bayern and everything, um you know, they, they, that environment, you know, if Arsenal was to find a way to even get a goal in like the first 15, 20 minutes, you know, that that crowd has seen a lot of foolishness this season. You know? A lot of foolishness, you know. So, you know, it could get toxic in there if them if them farm the fool early and Arsenal come out and blitz them on the counter a couple of times, you know. But the first goal in that second leg is going to be so crucial. Oh, my gosh. That's one thing I can tell you right now. That first goal in that second leg, people, crucial. Don't think they're going to try to possess the ball more. They don't have the players or the system. Well, then it's going to be it going to be a weird game then because I don't think that the, the way we were triggering the press so early in that first game, I don't see us doing that in this game. I think we'll fall into a much more mid-block shape and try to make them come play. Say, so, okay, play, break us down. I mean, not a low block or anything, but we, we, I don't think we're going to engage man-to-man -man so high. We're going to zone all, and then in, once they get to the middle, we'll, we'll, we'll put our press on them. And, and I think, because I think Arteta in that game would probably want to win the ball with space behind them to go attack. You know, not saying that he wouldn't want to win it close to their goal as well, but I feel like we'll probably do that in spurts of the game. It won't be as constant as it was in this last game that we just played at home. Where well, Foden ain't better than Sane for what I'm looking for, maybe for Pep. Yeah, that's a good point because, um, but but you know, to me, Pep likes that Sane winger as well, you know, because Doku is like a Sane, like direct. You know, I think the difference with Sane is like, you know, if he's I pre I think it, it the thing with Sane to me that makes him crazy is like he literally only goes left. Like, so rarely does he go to the right, no matter if he's on the left side or the right side. But him still, you can't stop it. He either go to the left and try to get by you or him pass it back or inside and combine. Very rarely does he go to the right. <clears throat> but it's, you still can't stop it. Like, even Saka is very left-footed, but he'll beat it on the right or try to, you know? But Foden is just a different player. Foden like the pockets. So what? So Sane is a bad youth like that, though. Like, I guess I, because they they had they had come with that narrative when he didn't make the German national team for the World Cup that time, and I was thinking like, but I guess I don't know everything about the inner workings about these teams and these players. But what has he really done? Him just seem like a bread away, you know. Wear a, wear a cap sometime, and you know, like I don't know. Maybe the nightlife in Manchester, I don't know. All right, people. So I'm gonna give a whole hour to the Arsenal because of that soccer penalty thing. Um crazy though, bro. That 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 was a crazy attitude after not getting minutes. Okay, so similar to Cancelo then. Cause Cancelo basically say, yo, where do I put me on bench? You know, so say me the biggest thing. <laughs> So some of them, some of them get the idea of the team and the rotation, and some of them don't because 
I mean, like it look like right now at the Brian, I get that. Well, him said that he was feeling unwell. But let's let's go to that game, people. The um the Real Madrid versus Manchester City game. So I I didn't get a chance to watch the entire game of this one, but this morning I watched the majority of the first half. Um before I kind of kind of ran out of time before I wanted to do the stream. But let me pull up first and foremost, people, how the team started out on the pitch today, or yesterday, I should say. Classic, classic match, man. This one ended 3-3, people. Crazy, crazy game. <laughs> Wait a second. Ask Mane or Sane stay. <laughs> Sane. Man, it bust up the man lip star. Sometimes I don't believe them attitude business here though, you know. I feel like coaches coaches paint that picture that who them want to paint it to. Foden is clear of Sane. I think at this point he's more consistent, so I have to give it to him. But Sane and his day, boys. Yeah, I'm good, man. He's really good. All right. So this right here, people, is the team sheets for the Real Madrid versus Manchester City. So they have Real Madrid here in a 4-2-3-1. I don't really think that's what they played in this game. I think it was more like a fourth, probably like a, I'd say like a 4-3, 4-3, 1-2 maybe, or even a 4-3-3. Um, but I, I don't think it was like a 4 2 3 1, but it was it was kind of like this. But they did a lot of moving around and changing. But basically, how it looked was looning in goal, which um has been playing really well this season, you know, if we're being honest. But um, you know, maybe the experience of Ariza Balaga could have helped in this one because he did have a couple of mistakes in the game, which we'll talk about. Ferland Mendy at left back, Rudiger, Chua many on the back line, you know, of course, Real Madrid right now. Eddie Militao just coming back. Nacho Fernandez, you know, usually gets the nod in the center back role when people aren't there, but he didn't play. Um, Fran Garcia, young wing back. So, not much in cover as far as defense goes right now. So, you know, Real Madrid kind of having to just have a makeshift back line kind of here. Too many, I know, has been playing the role lately, but you know, I think he's a true def um, central defensive midfielder personally. Um, and then Danny Carvajal, the veteran captain at the right back, and then midfield you had Tony Cruz, Camavinga, and Valverde. Who Valverde is one of my favorite players. People, I think he's one of the most underrated players probably in world football. To be honest, um, I don't really think there's anything in his game that he can't do well. He's great defending, great attacking. Um, strong outside, strong long shots, can can pick a pass, can play a long driving pass, incredible motor and energy, um, really, really good player. I think one of the the key components in, in this Madrid team whenever they do well. Um, and one of the unsung heroes, I would say. A lot of the other players get a lot of the credit because they have the stats, but I think Valverde is a really, really good player, people. Um, so Tony Cruz, Camavinga, Valverde, and then Jude Bellingham, Almost almost took up like a false nine role, but he kind of was playing more of a cam. And then you had Rodrigo and Vinicius Jr. in the attack, interchanging, dropping deep, playing wide, playing everywhere pretty much in the attacking third. Um, so very, very fluid type of system <clears throat> that they have in their attack. You don't really know where the players are going to pop up. And I think that's something that caused a lot of issues for Madrid on the day. Um, then Man City side now, they went with their trusted system, the 4 2 3 1. Um, Manuel Akanji, right back, Vardial, left back, Diaz, and Stones in the middle. Stefan Ortega kept his place in goal, even though Ederson, for the first time in a while, was on the bench. So that's one to look for in the Premier League moving forward. You know, does he stick with Ortega or bring Ederson back in? We'll see. Um, Rodri and Kovacic um, played deep. At, I want to say there was like a there was a, I think De Bruyne was due to start the game, I think, but was ill. Um, maybe somebody can help me with that. Father Bling, yeah. Um, just just be sure to turn on the bell. Maybe or maybe it was something on YouTube's end, you know. Jason Guna TV is a growing channel. Maybe them not rate me yet. I'm soon rate me though. 
in due time, in due time. Real good goals in that game. Yeah, man, this game was mad. The Valverde goal was fire. Yeah. And before I talk about it, I don't want to get it out there how much I rate the player because you know how people think I just stream score yesterday, you know? I've always thought he's a really good player. So Roger and Kovacic in the in the deeper role in midfield. Then he had Bernardo Silva um playing that role on the right. But him and Foden really did a lot of interchanging. So, you know, it, sometimes Foden was out there, sometimes Silva in here. Grealish kind of held this position a bit more. But I did think that Grealish did a good job of finding the game in the middle of the park as well and playing in the half spaces in here at times, which I think was causing issues for Carvajal because, you know, he didn't really know where to be at times um so yeah both teams just showed their fluidity in attack and really why they caused defenses so much trouble um <clears throat> if you look here on the attack momentum both teams kind of had their times in the game where they had their momentum but i would give city the slight edge in that especially that second half stretch where they were able to turn the tide to make it 3-2 i thought that was the dominant the most dominant stretch of the game of any team um this stretch in the first half though after after the own goal and the second goal, after the own goal, um, <clears throat> Alfa Diaz, and then the second goal by Rodrigo, I thought that Madrid had their best spell of the game, um, probably from about, you know, the first half that I watched in full. They were really on top from, you know, when that second goal scored, I'd say till about maybe the 40th or 35th minute. But I do think that City's run in the second half where they had the strength in the play was probably the best run of the game. Um, you know, as I said before, people, there wasn't much that Real Madrid could do off of the bench today. Um, you know, Luka Modric, probably the only fully fit, you know, player that's, you know, one you would really want to count on to do anything in a match of this nature. He did come on for Tony Cruz in the 72nd minute um, and did have a part to play in actually the, the third goal scored by Valverde. It was the one that drove the ball forward to play the pass to... Um, Vinicius, who ended up finding Valverde. But it's going to go through the game. Basically, as I said before, people, Jack Grealish did a good job, I thought, in this match of just finding, you know, some of the inside forward channels that normally he kind of starts on this wide position. But I thought tactically he did a smart job of just finding the openings because, you know, Valverde and Carvajal pretty much had to do the bulk of the defending on this side of the pitch because... Vinicius, Bellingham, and Rodrigo really didn't have much defensive duties on the day. I mean, yes, they would track back and stuff, but you know, I think they were the triggers to, to counter City. And of course, when City is in full out attack mode, at times it's just Diaz and and you know Diaz by himself. Maybe Akanji might be back there as well. Vardiol has pushed up. You know, Stones gone into midfield. Rodri gone to go play forward, and you know, so they can be caught out on the counter. Um, that's pretty much how they get caught out most of the time, <clears throat> City, to be honest. And I thought that, you know, because the midfield had Camavinga, Valverde in it, two really hard workers in midfield, and Cruz, who is just so intelligent that even though he can't run very fast, he's just always in the right screening positions in midfield. So they had that nice solid base there and could just leave, um, you know, the three attackers to kind of, stay and wait ready for the counter but the first goal really came about because jack Grealish got a ball in the half space in the infield turn made a run at the defense and was brought down actually an early yellow card from chuamini and basically the free kick was from about where eduardo camavinga is on this graphic on the screen and you know most of the time bernardo silva would just clip a ball into the back post and everyone's lined up here to run in for that ball now I don't know if it was pre-planned or Silva just saw it in the moment, but boy, the um the the, the speed of thought there to, to put that ball where he put it, you know, didn't really tuck it all the way in the corner, but just the just the the surprise nature of him trying that near post shot low along the ground, you know, at a at a hard height for the keeper to kind of keep it out. The keeper did get a hand on it, but um couldn't quite couldn't quite keep it out but that was a brilliant brilliant play by bernardo silva to make it one nil um and then pretty much right after that you know real madrid you know, kind of woke up um you know you saw 
immediately after that, Rodrigo and Vinicius kind of link up and have a play down the left side, get all the way into the box. It didn't come to anything, but I think that first little run out by Madrid really kind of, you know, put some belief in them. And then from that point, they kind of started to turn the screw at home a little bit. And of course, they got the fortune of the deflection of Diaz from the Camavinga play. But you could kind of see that they were growing into the game, even though they were down 1-0. And then really soon after that, a brilliant play um, after City got a little bit of possession in their half. Um, they were able to win the ball, find Vinicius Jr. And he played a beautiful through pass to Rodrigo down the left side. Um, and the absence of Kyle Walker showed in the moment because, you know, maybe Kyle Walker can run and try to prevent that finish. But Akanji just doesn't have that same speed. So, you know, it was it was really a mismatch on the foot race. And Rodrigo kept his composure and got a little lucky on the finish, but was able to tuck it away to make it 2-1. Then, as I said, I think Madrid, you know, for the most part after that, in the first half, I thought, you know, they didn't, they huffed and puffed, but they didn't really, you know, have that great of a chance, I would say, after that um, in the first half. But I do think that they did have the better of play. Um, but Man City was able to, at times, just keep possession and, and you know, not let the game get out of hand, <clears throat> which is what they're always capable of doing. So uh, if we look at the stats overall, people, Actually, I want to break it down to the first half. So, so Man City had more possession, 63% to 37%. As I said, I, I think that um, going into this game, I don't believe that Real Madrid really wants the ball in this in this scenario. I think they know that Man City is most vulnerable when they have been, you know, attacking and they're building their play. And, you know, they, they go into their 2-3-5 that they like to go into and all these things. Um, you know, they, they like their chances against the against the back line with the forwards that they do have on the counter. Um, so for all that possession, Madrid had more shots, more shots on target. Um, you know, they, they had the only big chance of the match that was registered, right? Um, and they did finish it. They had four counters and three shots from those. So, I mean, it was obvious, people, that Ancelotti's tactic was, listen, Man City is the best possession team in the world, but let's not try to outpossess them. Let's let's do what we're best at, which is break quickly on teams. Uh, Madrid have one of the deadliest counterattacks in the world, and they've had it for a few years now. Um, Vinicius Jr., Rodrigo, and now the addition of Bellingham, um, you know, it's it's very formidable. So, you know, I think I think Ancelotti just took what what's given to him. Um, you know, it wasn't, and I think why it worked really as well was whereas Arsenal against them tended to have eleven men behind the ball. Um, you know, Real Madrid was willing to take the risk to have Rodrigo, Vinicius, especially them two kind of stay beyond the play. At least one of them was on the half line at all times. And I think that's the, you know, that that little bit of extra bravery is why the tactic works so well for them on the day. Um, but I have to give Man City credit because in the second half, they really, really, really turned the screw on Real Madrid. Um, let me check in with this. <laughs> uh... Yeah, <clears throat> so it was the Bruyne that was feeling ill. Yeah, I think I think the plan actually was to play the Br play silver where Kovacic was, and have the Bruyne and Foden in that attacking area. But he wasn't feeling well. Bless up, big deal. Okay, the boss official now. Big deal, photography people. No more big league len. So it's big deal photography. Me not, no more big league len. Yo, 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 Mannings, big up, you know. Yeah, man. <clears throat> Where's a 2 0 win in Munich? That's the, that's the hope, my friend. That's the hope. Phone goal, goal of the day. Was it? It's a good question, you know, people. Of all the goals yesterday, what was the goal of the day? You know, say, you know, say, I'm really going to give. Um, damn, phone goal, bad, though, you know. Vardyol had a good goal as well with his weak foot. I think it's between Valverde and, and Foden goal. I mean, I try... I, mean, I like the fact that the Valverde one was a pinpoint cross and a volley. 
but the shot from phone, the quality of where put that to. Why well, it's tough, people. Let me know, people. Which which one you think better? Valverde goal or phone goal? Oh, Jano, we swear it's a big league length gone, but him there the same way. My word. All right, my bro. Well, when at this one, I'm going to address you. Profesh, big deal photography. Make sure you subscribe to the man thing. Okay, so Demo disagree. Demo say Valverde. Boy, I lean that way to you, know, Demo. Slightly to Valverde. I just like the fact that it was a cross, pinpoint, and the man running and valid. So accurate when valid. I don't think it's like that far, Demo, but yeah, I'd agree that Valverde won better. Big deal, say Valverde. Signal, say the valley. Some, some mornings, it look like a you one say phone so far, you know. <laughs> man say, you know, no ball. My gosh. All right, Brent. Yeah, 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 I am sure sports. Say phone. Demo, you could have said any player, but you choose to pick a player we don't play for, for about 25 years just because he come from Liverpool. You mean the Thiago with it there, Barca? And he used to play. I mean, yeah, Ford never have a volley for him, on, but when I go on like the man, just never bake it in the, in the pigeon root. I was a wicked shot by the by Foden, brother. But I still think Valverde went better. But me now I gotta say by no mile. Mile I go too far now. Very, very good goal though. All right. So second half, people, as I was saying before, I just want to look upon the breakdown of the stats in the second half, right? So it was much of the same, but I want to point out you see that City had less possession, but look at the difference in the shots on target in that second half with the less possession. So they had more effective possession. And another thing I want to notice, look at the second half counter-attacks. So what did Pep do, people? You might be wondering, what did Pep do differently in the second half to, to stem the tide of the counter-attacks? Well, one thing me see him do for sure, in the first half, Vardiol was pushed way up, way up the pitch. And, in the, and I bet you, they don't have the heat map breakdown by half. But you see, most of this right here in the, in the attacking half, I bet you it was the first half. And you see this, these right here, where I'm starting position is a little deeper, is probably the second half. Because Pep realized that, yo, them now do nothing if we just stay in our shape, you know. And him just tell Vardiol, yo, just start 10 minutes, just don't go 10 yards as far as you've been going. See, a kanji on the other side, same thing. First half, this was probably more than likely him heat map. And I bet him average position in the second half was more like this. So all he did was say, Stones, you still do your midfield thing. But instead of just leaving Ruben pretty much by himself, <laughs> I'm going to have a kanji and Vardil stay similar to where Ruben did. Look for Ruben heat map. So this was probably first half, and look now, with the help around him, this was more than likely where he was at in the second half, people. So that little slight tweak, Greeley stayed wider in the second half because Vardial wasn't pushed as high. Kovacic pushed a bit higher in the second half as well, wasn't as deep. And Rodri <clears throat> had the freedom to push up as well. So... He figured out, okay, I can still get as much joy in the attack without having my wing box bomb because I have enough fluidity in attack everywhere that people are going to pop up in the areas and overload where I need them to without my wing box doing that. And I can keep my solid three to, to combat their three against us, right? And that difference stemmed the tide of the counter-attack in the second half. So, you know, I thought both games were... Four very good coaches going tit for tat with each other um, and making those tactical changes to give their team a better chance to win. 
And I think that's going to continue in the second leg as well. So, you know, both games heavily in the balance. Of course, City and Bayern have to be the favourites due to them being at home. But um, I don't think they should rest on the fact that they're at home to, to think they're going to get this result. It's going to be tough. So, yeah, people, those were the two Champions League games. Um, definitely awesome, awesome games. I think in the in the in the city game, especially, you know, just want to touch on the goals in the second half, of course. Foden in the 66 with that racket from the top of the box, and then Vardial cutting in from the from the left back position, really high up the pitch. Um, kind of surprised everyone, myself included, to even attempt that shot on the right foot. And he struck it beautifully, curly to the far post. And then, of course, the volley that I thought was the goal of the day. And most people did. Valverde from a um Vinicius Jr. cross to make it two, I mean, three, three, excuse me. Um, yeah, so definitely great, great games. Um, of course, as a reminder, people, today we have two more Champions League quarterfinals coming up. Um, get my little book out, remind everyone of my prediction. So yesterday's games, I had predicted a 3-2 for Madrid, so I was close there. And a 3-1 for Bayern. So got the, I mean a 3-1 for Arsenal, excuse me. So I got the right amount of goals in the Arsenal game, but not the scoreline. So didn't have any correct results yesterday. But today I'm going for a um PSG Barcelona. And I'm not going to like this because I'm probably going to think it's impossible. But I think it's going to be nil all people. I just think it's going to be one of those weird games where nobody don't score a goal. I think Atletico Madrid gets the win at home. And I think they're going to beat them 2-1 today. So I could be wrong on that, people, but I just have this funny feeling that the PSG Barca match going to draw and it's going to be a goalless draw. But we'll see. I could be I could be very wrong. It could be another three all or something mad. Four and a half turn and finish. Yeah, man, him have to. Yeah, man, I remember the goal, Demo. The one. Great highlight in the CL that Thiago ever had for your team. You want to whisper? <laughs> Played football, understand that hitting the top bin in 10 while shot while they are not in the ground in the corners is 6.78. What? Anyone who has played football understand that hitting the top bin 3.5 in 10. Okay. While shot volley are not in the ground. In the corners is 6.78 out of 10. Is that what you what are you saying? I'm not certain what you're saying there. Oh, level of difficulty was harder to hit the top bin. I mean, is that is that like is that proven though? That is harder to hit the top bins than to score a volley in a corner. I don't know. Keep on a good bro clown that. So, wait. Pan the Foden shot? Come on, bro. No, I wouldn't save that neither. Accurate Yorker versus good line outside half stump. So, which one harder in a cricket? Bayern from the money next leg. Yeah, I can't wrong a person for saying Byron still. We have faith on my side though. We're gonna win, man. Yeah, man, the Madrid game was mad. Two home victories today. Could I see it? I think Madrid are gonna get it, but PSG, I think they're gonna go stumble, man. I mean, I think everything is all rosy over there. All right, so let me know. So that's the UCL people and the predictions for later. Um, let's go move on and do a quick little search. And we had a few players play some games yesterday in, in the English football leagues. So let's head there and do a little check-in with them. All right, so I know we had some players play in the champ. And I just want to big up 
Oh, that was not the last game. Where is it? Okay. Yes, people. So the first thing I want to do, let's just look at the championship table um, and see what that's looking like at the current moment. So we have in first place less than 88 points, Leeds in second and 87, and Ipswich third and 87. Ipswich has a game today against Watford, um, who is down there in 14th place. So hopefully Ipswich can get that result and get back to the top two places for the automatic promotion. Um Fourth place, Southampton, actually is a team that played Coventry yesterday. And that's the first game that I wanted to check and see how Coventry fared. Of course, we're pulling for Coventry to get into this top six to make the playoffs. But with each passing week, it's getting more and more daunting for them. Now only five games remain. And they are at this point five points out of that six spot. So it's going to be an uphill battle for them to get there. Let's see how they fared yesterday. Really needed to find a way to get this result on the road against a good team. Also in the playoff position, Southampton. Um, but let's see how our reggae boys did on the day yesterday. So I know that Joel Latibo there started. Um, and it looks like he played the entire game, had a yellow card. And I know that when I checked the team sheet yesterday, I did not see Casey starting. But he did come on in the 81st. So let's go ahead and take a look at Joel Latibo there's game. Um, played right back in the back four yesterday. Um, 90 minutes played, did get a yellow card, had 0.11 expected goals. So it looks like he got close to scoring maybe from a set piece. Three clearances on the day, two tackles. He was dribble past three times though, so that's tough. Four for 10 ground duels, three of four on his aerials, not bad. Um, he had 69 touches of the ball, lost it 11 times overall, committed two fouls, one of those being a yellow, and he was fouled twice. He was 43 or 51 for his passes for 84%. So can always count on him being somewhere in the 80s or better. Always good with his distribution. He was 0 for 2 on his crosses. He was 3 of 5 on his long passes. And he had one shot off target. And he did also earn a penalty for his team that was actually not converted um, in the 10th minute. So, And Haji Wright actually taking the penalty, which is... Oh, does Haji Wright take their penalties all the time? That really seems might take them. Um, so yeah, Haji Wright had a missed penalty, and as you can see, 5.6 are not the best outing for him. But yeah, so Joel Latiba there, um, really pretty much his attacking stats would have been what brought him up to that 6.9, almost a seven. Um, you know, did get dribble pass three times, which I'm sure brought it down a bit more as well. And you know, he's on a defense that conceded twice. So 6.9, not bad. Um, definitely could have been a little bit higher if um if uh if his defensive stats were a little bit better on the day but he was dribbled past a few times um now let's check our boy casey palmer who did come into the match in the 81st minute of course coventry at this time trying to chase the game being down 2-1 they were able to get one back in the 68th minute and casey came in for the end of the game to try and find that equalizer and potentially the winner so he came on played nine minutes plus injury time had seven touches he was four or five for 80 percent had one key pass out of those four passes he was over one on his long pass attempts um he did lose the ball twice he was one for two on his duels and he did commit i mean did um have one tackle in his short stint on the pitch so pretty active for casey in his nine minutes on the field did have a key pass and did have a tackle so that's good um Maybe the coach will look back and say, boy, could I have gotten him in the game a little bit earlier? As you can see, really went to the bench for the first time for Fabio Tavares, who is more of a winger, to replace Van Eyvick, who was playing ahead of Latibo there, there on that right side, um, and really didn't put on another attacking sub until he put Casey Palmer on in the 81st minute. These other guys are pretty much defenders. Well, Jay De Silva is kind of a wide midfielder, so maybe not him as much. But, um, you know... Not really much off the bench to bring on. I think this guy's a young kid, I want to say. Lasula, Lusala. And Kai Andrews is also a kid. So, looks like Coventry might be suffering with a bit of injuries in the attacking area. Because they really didn't have much options to change the game. Um, and on the Southampton side, as you can see. Um, one that we don't really highlight a lot because... You know, I don't know how far along the process he is, but I do know that he has the potential to play for us, and that's Kyle Walker-Peters. He had a really good game, a 7.9. 
uh, probably one of the best wing backs in the championship this season um, for, throughout the course of the year. And definitely a player that um, right now I want to say is what, 26? Yeah, 26 years old. Um, probably approaching that time when he would be thinking about, yeah, maybe I should just go ahead and make the switch to Jamaica because, you know, my England time may have come and passed. Um, but yeah, definitely a player that would add quality. As you can see, he's a right-footed player, but can play left or right back. So just another versatile option that we could use. Um, so Kyle Walker-Peters doing his thing in the championship. Um, and then I know we had some players play in League One yesterday as well. Um, Swansea also plays at, plays later today as well. So we'll be looking out for Jamal Lowe to see what he does, if he can do something today. Here's the table, people, for League One. Um, of course, Oxford United and Barnsley and Peterborough all have Jamaican. So good to see that we have some potential players getting to the playoffs in this league. Um, I think maybe Barnsley would have an outside shot to maybe get to second place. But, you know, eight points with about four to play is, you know, pretty hard to make up. So more than likely, they will just want to stay in the top six. Lincoln, Blackpool, Stevenage all hovering around that six spot where Oxford is occupying right now. Um, so let's look at the fixtures, people, that we had yesterday. I know, let's see, the ninth. So Cheltenham, Carlisle, Leighton, Exeter, Bristol, and Reading. Let me just check Reading, people. I want to see if Kanaya made the bench or anything. Lately, he has been third string again because Button is fit and Pereira is fit. So, yeah, he's playing under 21, so he wasn't there. So, Kanaya Boys Clark struggling to get into the first team bench or on the team sheet. Charlton Wigan, definitely one we want to check because we have our two reggae boys, Michael Hector and Karai Anderson. So, let's look at the team sheet for this game. All right, so this one ended to all people. Michael Hector had a yellow but did get a 7.0 rating playing in the center of the back three again. Looks to be his home at this point. 90 minutes played. Two clearances, two block shots, two tackles, no dribble pass. Very good. Three for five on his ground duels. Did not go into an aerial. They know not to even try. Um, 13 possession lost out of the 85 touches he had. So had a lot of touches on the ball. One foul and was fouled once. So he had one foul and got a yellow card for the one foul. Um, I think actually... Let's see. Actually, no, he argued, so it wasn't even for a foul. <clears throat> All right, and um, passing was really accurate on the day, 63 for 74 of eight, for 85 percent. So really good, especially when you factor in that he attempted 20 long passes and had 13 connecting. So that's very, very good there. Went long a lot, but at least he was very successful. So 85 percent accuracy, solid in defense, solid in his ground duels, didn't get dribble pass. Definitely worthy of a 7.0 out of 10. And if you look at uh, Michael Hector's recent games, he's been pretty much a 7.0 or better for the most part. And Karoy Anderson did start again today in that role. He's been playing a little more attacking in front of that line of four in midfield. Um, he played 87 minutes, as you can see on his heat map. Pretty active um, in the attacking third. Spent most of his time kind of drifting to the right side. 87 minutes played. One shot blocked. He was one for three on his dribbles. He had 44 touches and lost the ball 12 times. He was 23 of 30 on his passes for 77%. 0 for 1 on crosses. 4 for 11 on his ground duels. 3 for 6 on his aerial duels. And um, he had three fouls and was fouled once on the day. And he did have two tackles in defense. Um, 6.7 for him. Seems to be getting 6.7s every time. Um... You know, I, I did mention last time, since he's in this more attacking role, I would love to see the key passes start to develop. Had another day where he didn't have any key passes, but the passing accuracy was a lot better than the last game, and he had much less possession loss in this game as well. So, um, good good uh, performance from Kerroy. Lasted a bit longer this time as well. Played 87 minutes, so that's good. Uh, and I just love to see him continually getting the minutes. Love the fact that he can play where you see Dobson and Coventry playing or he plays in this kind of more advanced role as well. So just like to see that he's getting different looks in different spots on the pitch. This will only aid him in his development. Again, people, as I always like to remind everyone, you know, we're always talking about we want to be old man in the side and all these things. 
this kid is 19 years old, people. 19. So we don't have Pierre Oldman in the team. So let's stop saying that narrative, please and thanks. So League One. Uh, don't believe Oxford play until today or even the weekend. Yeah, so Peterborough does have a game later today, but Oxford doesn't play again until the weekend. But we do have some more players that we need to look at, people. Stevenage defeated Barnsley, so they took a hit in their quest to remain in the top six yesterday. Um, Barnsley lost two to one, and we did have a couple of reggae boys seeing the feel of play. Um, John Russell, who has been out of the coaches squad for the last few windows, um, still getting his minutes at Barnsley though. But for some reason, 65 minutes, he keeps coming off of these games. I don't understand because when I look at his stats, they look good. 31 touches, 92% accuracy on his passes. No key passes, but he was 2 for 2 on his long passes. One shot on target, 0 for 1 dribbling. 2 for 5 in ground duels, 0 for 1 in aerial duels. He only lost the ball three times in 31 touches. He had two fouls committed and he was fouled once. He had one interception, one tackle, and he wasn't dribble pass. So, um, yeah, I, I need to I need to figure out why John Russell can't play a full 90 minutes. It seems like his partners never have better stats than him, but they end up staying on the pitch longer. So I don't know if he's on a minute's restriction or what, but he seems to have in performances worthy of him staying on the field and he keeps coming off. Devante Cole, as we saw from the last game, people, um, came off the bench this time again. As we as we showed on his last last episode we did, we showed his games and where his goals have come from. And the last two months, they've really dried up his goal contribution. So he's really struggling for farm right now. 24 minutes played off the bench plus injury time. He had one shot off target, one shot blocked. He was 0 for 1 on his dribble attempts. Had 15 touches, 1 for 2 for 50% passing. Um, he did lose the ball eight times out of his 15 touches, two for seven on ground duels, 0 for two on aerials, um, two fouls. One Once he was fouled, he was offside one time, and he made one tackle for 6.5. So 6.5 on a day for Devante still couldn't find the net in any way, and his team really needed him to find it because it ended 2-1 there for this one. So uh, let's go back to League One. And as I said, people, this is the top six that everybody's fighting for. And Barnsley still, you know, looking good at 74, but um, they do have some teams that can maybe catch up to them. Um, and Peterborough has two games in hand, so they could potentially get to that second spot. But that will start today if they can get by Port Vale. So we'll be looking and seeing how that goes for them and see if Peterborough can make their way into that into that top two where they don't have to worry about playoffs and those things. Um, so, yeah, that's that's pretty much the roundup of those who played. Let me just make one quick last check in League 2 and make sure that none of the ball of them never played there. We do have a couple. Salford, pretty much, pretty much safe from relegation at this point, almost. Uh, they did have some games yesterday, but the Salford boys did not play. And I don't believe they played today either. Yeah, there are no midweek games. So, yeah, so not in League 2 yesterday, people. And all of our other players, either their teams didn't have cup games or there just were no games for them yesterday. So, wasn't that many reggae boys in action yesterday. Um, all the reggae boys in MLS are out of the Champions Cup now. Um, well, not all of them. I think Cincinnati plays. Well, Cincinnati is out. So, yeah, all of them are out now. Yeah, they lost to Monterey. Because <clears throat> of the away goal. Yeah, so they're out. So, yeah, speaking on, just speaking on Champions Cup yesterday, people, there was there were um two opposite ends of the spectrum for the MLS yesterday. So, uh, on one hand, America beat Tigres, I think it was 5-2 last night, to win 9-2 on aggregate, a, a battering. And then on the other hand, Columbus went to Tigres, got the one all that they needed to force extra time, and then Columbus was victorious on penalties. So 
two ends of the spectrum how the MLS teams fared yesterday. Um, and we're no we're no it's now down to Messi and company to try to overturn overturn their game tonight when they head to Mexico to face Monterey in the second leg, being down two one. And of course Monterey has two goals away on them. So it's an uphill climb for Inter Miami. So we'll see if they can even up the score in the semifinals, have two Mexican teams and two US teams after America and um, Columbus book their place in the semifinals for the Champions Cup. So um, I'm not going to touch on that too much, but just wanted to briefly bring that up. Also, um, following on from the weekend, you know, of course, I did take the family to the She Believes Cup and the third place game and the final happened yesterday. Um, the third place match... Actually, I need to check and see how that went. I didn't really. I know it was it was one all after the game was over and it went to penalties. But I didn't actually look and see who won the penalties. Um okay, so Brazil won the penalties, people, after losing a shootout to Canada to make it to the final. Wow, Japan didn't score any penalties in the shootout. And then I did get a chance to watch the final, though, with, with um, USA and Canada. And, of course, that one ended 2 all, and it went straight to PKs as well. And USA ended up winning that one 5-4 um, in penalties, which was a very exciting shootout, actually. Um, but good game. I thought Canada had stretches where they had the better of play. USA had their time as well. Um, Adriana Leon with a double for, the, for, for Canada. One from open play, one from the penalty spot. And Sophia Smith for the double for USA. So, um, you know, the stars of the two teams kind of showed up big. Um, and, yeah, it was, a, it was a good game. I think the She Believes Cup was really good. Four good teams, good matches. Um, and, you know, USA got the, got the bragging rights this time over Canada, as they did recently at the Women's Gold Cup as well. So, um, yeah, good, good, good game. Good games, good games. Fun to watch. International, another international window and no reggae girls inside people. So sad, 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 sad. So the next thing that I wanted to touch on, people, before we end the show for today is the under-20 CONCACAF draw, which will be held tomorrow. And I just want to get back into the people's minds as far as... um you know what where where are we at what are the timelines you know wh what what do we need to be looking at in terms of you know important dates that are coming up so let me close this off and move on to the concacaf site i'm just going to go and look at the article Yeah, so this people is just CONCACAF announcing the official draw. This was back on the 25th of March, but the draw has gotten to us and it is going to happen tomorrow, people, 11 a.m. Eastern time, which is 10 o'clock in Jamaica, of course. Um, so the format for this is going to be a group stage, um, you know, which we've already had, um, or a qualifying, which we've already had, and then a group stage now with the 12 teams remaining. So, um, of course, there's going to be three pots for this, or four pots for this, excuse me. The three highest-ranked teams will be in pot one. That's USA, Honduras, and Mexico. Pot two will have the three lowest-ranked teams. Um, in this case, it's going to be... What? Okay, so the three lowest ranked teams of the top two pots, <laughs> Panama, Costa Rica, and Damrep. Um, and then and then the next two pots, which are part three and four, have all the qualified teams out of the groups that were played recently in the various you know places. So part three, which is the three highest ranked teams of the of the six, has Guatemala, El Salvador, and Cuba. Part four, the three lowest ranked teams have Jamaica, Haiti, and Canada. So, of course, one team from each of these pots will consist the three groups of four, right? Um, so, 
this tournament is going to take place from July the 19th. And if Jamaica make it all the way to the final, that will be held on August the 4th. Right? So, of course, to make it to the World Cup, um, the top four or the semi-finalists will be guaranteed of their participation. Right? Um, so, yeah, as long as we can make it to the semis, which, of course, the last time we played this competition, we fell out at the quarterfinal stage to the Dominican Republic. So we were one game away, um, regardless of all the foolishness that happened with that selection of that team and the coaching and the tactical decisions. We still somehow were only one result away from going to the World Cup. Now, people, my, my, the reason why I wanted to talk about this today is because I wanted to just dive into what has gone on with this U20 team so far. Of course, we had the qualifying that we played in St. Kitts the other day. John Wall led the team out. Um, he was able to get three victories in that competition. Um, <clears throat> and it was, you know, maybe not the best viewing in terms of how we played. But, you know, we, we got the job done and we qualified, which is what we needed to do, right? Um, wait, was it three victories or did we draw one? I can't remember. Let me see some people. Okay, so here are the matches right there. View all. standings so just revisiting the standings people we had four teams in the group yes we did get the three wins i couldn't remember exactly i know martinique one nil the fluke goal on that one um two nil over grenada and then the three two in the last game over bermuda So, yeah, people, we did get the three wins, but, you know, some people weren't so happy with the displays. Um, you know, maybe made tougher work than we wanted to of it. But I will say that, you know, based on based on the team that we had and based on the fact that I knew that in the summer window we might have the chance to have some more professional players in the setup, you know, I, I thought that we had a decent enough chance to to to, to make some noise in this qualifier, in this championship coming up. Um now, of course, about, I'd say about, what, a week or two after that tournament concluded, the, the qualifiers, um, we found out that John Wall was being relieved of his duties as U20 manager due to his workload being too large with the summer being so hectic. Um, World Cup qualifiers in June, Copa America end of June leading into July. Um, and then, you know, with the first match in this competition being somewhere around July the 17th, 18th, 19th, depending on what group we're in, um, you know, it just would be too much for, for him to be in so many places at once looking at so many things. And we were told that his replacement was going to be Jerome Waite, um, you know, current manager or head coach of Wilma's Boys School, as well as Tivoli Gardens Football Club in the Premier League. Um, now, of course, Tivoli Gardens made the playoffs, are going to be in the playoff, you know, the play-in round, I guess you could call it, um, going up against Waterhouse coming up here soon. Um, and then if they get through that, we'll have the semifinals and potential finals to play in the Premier League. Now, maybe John PL fan or somebody else that is privy to this information can let me know. But, you know, when exactly would the Jamaica Premier League you know, semifinals and finals be happening. What I was told was there's a two-week break before the, the semifinals round starts, or not the semifinal round, but that next round of matches to come up starts. Um, and it, it does say here 22nd of April, 22nd of April, and 28th of April um, are the dates for that next round of matches that will see Tivoli playing Waterhouse and Arne Gardens playing Portmore in two legs. Um, but what I would be interested to know, people, is when is the actual semifinals? Because if that match is the 28th, I would think maybe they want another week, maybe two weeks rest, but probably a week. So then we're talking the beginning of May. 
So when is the Premier League supposed to end, people? That's what I want to know. Because I would love for Jerome Waite to be able to focus on this under-20 team. Okay, so May 5 and May 12 for the semis, which means that the finals would probably be, what, the 19th or sometime a week or so after that? Or maybe they haven't put the date yet. Okay, so May 19th is the finals. So my question is this, people. The reasons given for why John Wall was removed or relieved or whatever you want to call it of his duties with that team was because of workload being too much, right? So my question is, isn't the workload of Jerome Waite similar to that of John Walls? I know his Woolmer's boys' school duties are probably not that much of a deal right now. But I would like to think that Woolmer's boys' school would like to have their program up and running by about June. Right? You know, once the school year ends, they're right back at it for the summer. So not only does he have that, he has the end of the Premier League season to contend with. And remember, people, the first game of this CONCACAF Under-20 Championships, potentially, potentially, is July the 19th, July the 20th, July the 21st. It's going to be one of those three days. So that is if... Tivoli get to the finals, which is possible. They would have a match one month before, potentially, the first match in this CONCACAF Under-20. And so many times when we go to these tournaments, the big thing that I hear is, boy, if we had only, you know, pre prepared as much as the other teams did and for as long as the other teams did. Now, in the moment of them getting rid of the coach, when I was given the reasons I was given, I said, okay, great. I don't want the coach to have this be his fifth, sixth, seventh, you know, choice. I don't want, I don't want this to, to, to him to have so much things to do that he can't focus on, you know, the, the, the U20 team and give it the time that it so rightly deserves if they're going to be successful. But to turn around and put a co uh, another coach in place that definitely has other things going on leading up to this tournament, you know, it's what was the point of removing the other one? Or is it that the, the Tivoli workload don't match up to the reggae boys' workload? You know, because that could be a thing too. They analyze it and say, boy, how much will it take for to really prepare Tivoli? You should still be able to do something else. But I just don't think it makes sense. I mean, is it that all the good coaches in Jamaica, I mean, there aren't any available because there's a lack of good coaches, so they're going to get every job that's available. So is that something we need to look at people like, do we need to have more dedicated coaches in terms of like for each age group from the JFF standpoint? Or can we continue to just pluck from this schoolboy team or this Premier League team or this whatever, here's a third job for you to come and do with the national team. Can we get the best results having that mindset, people? I'm not sure. I think we need to have more dedicated coaches to these actual things. That's a good question, Rob Smith. I'm not sure. I mean, his his the camp that he represents, not Chelsea, but the the the, the Phoenix camp seems to have. A, be having a lot of issues with the JFF currently. So I don't know if that's going to be across the board, you know, Phoenix is off the grid for now. I don't know. But he should be. He should be a part of that U20. He should look to be dominating this tournament and getting into, like, the player, this, you know, team of the tournament and these things like that. Respect Jam PL fans. So May 5th and 12th for the semis and May 19th. And I see the playing round is 22nd and 28th. So I'm going to validate them now. Wasn't just workload but conflict. Okay, but Rob, doesn't doesn't um Jerome Waite have this have a similar conflict of schedule with, with what he has to deal with with his club team? 
And is it that he's just going to not care about um, Wilmers at all in the summer? To be fair, Speed never exactly cited workload, but rather his expertise are more needed. Okay, okay. Well, Jam PL fan maybe not cited it in print media, but I heard him talking on, on these platforms. And he did reference, you know, John was going to have to go to this tournament in Turkey, plus, you know, um, prepare for the Nations League finals, then prepare for the World Cup qualifying. And due to how integral he is in the preparation for the reggae boys in terms of like tactics on any given day and, and you know, ways to to defeat an opponent or ways to set up to stop an opponent, we didn't want to take him away from that role in any way. But he did cite the, the load of work as well. Can we recruit players from across the desperate? He has never done so in his career. Can we talk to these? Well, the only thing that, the only reason I haven't really put that in my argument against weight is because Again, I'm going to go off of what I heard Speed saying because he seems to be the one that speaks for all of these things when they happen. He said that, um, you know, any correspondence John has had with teams or clubs or players outside, you know, from across the diaspora, all those contacts and, 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 and um, you know, summaries John would have made and scouting reports have been turned over to to Jerome Waite. So we'll see what he does with it. Um, but I don't think Waite is tasked with recruiting anybody. He just will have a list of recruited players that he will go and say, okay, I want him, 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 and him. Um, will he do that well? And will he, you know, put in the work to really know the players before making his decisions? How much will he lean on what has given to him? How much will he do his own research? That part I couldn't tell you. But I, I believe he has a, a strong enough database with what was already there to make decisions on, on who, who should be in the squad. Up three. Yeah, I know that the schoolboy and club is a thing, but some of those coaches are what we look at as our best coaches in the island. And so if those candidates are who you would want coaching your various national teams, especially at the youth level, is there ever going to be a situation where our youth coach, if he's a local coach, doesn't have two, three other teams that him coach to? I don't think so. Because from what I gather, they don't get paid much to do this portion of what they do. They might get more from the schools and the clubs than they even get from the JFF. And I don't know that to be fact. I'm kind of speculating there. But, you know, I would think if, if they were getting paid well enough, they wouldn't feel the need to have two, three other jobs. Because I think if you're running the program properly, that job is a year-round job. You'd have to be scouting players constantly, looking at players, going to watch players if you can afford it, buying for streaming service so you can watch players if you can't go watch them. Um, you know, it's a year-round job, I would think, to coach a youth national team because you want to be able to watch all your players doing their various things around the world, especially in Jamaica situation. It is different. We lean heavily on our diaspora due to the lack of development locally and the lack of the boys playing enough games and playing enough football. Um, we we'll have to use the diaspora at times. And I think in order to, to truly scout for any of our youth teams, it would have to be a year-round thing. Have to. You can't just say, all right, when this season done, we can focus for a month on it, and then we gone back to Tivoli, and then we come back to Reggae Boys for this two week, and then we, no, it not going to work so. I believe we would not qualify for the Under-20 World Cup because I have the same feeling like the last Under-20. Boy, I hope, I hope you're wrong, Martin, but I can't wrong if I have in that feeling. Uh, Martin, no, you know, I, I, not, I don't have no calling currently. That's something that I definitely want to work on in the very, very, very near future. So keep an eye out for the calling, Martin. I was at, at one point I was going to do it, but I'm going to get a, I'm going to get another, I'm going to get a burner first. 
Because I don't really want this line. I don't want to know about me all the time on the line that I have right now. And the extra line then I give to my other daughter. So I just need to add a next line. And that's that going to be the chop phone when you can call me any manner of the day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But coming soon, Martin Baker. I guess I missed that interview. Yeah, well, he show up a lot on these platforms, you know. So if you missed it, so it go. You can't catch all of them. I, I am on a lot of these YouTube platforms and give my comments, but I miss shows as well. So it happens. It happens. But yeah, it was out there and he mentioned the workload as well. But he did mention the expertise part. So you're not wrong there, but he did also cite the workload. I think the senior boys will be in camp June and July to work out qualifiers and cope. I don't know exactly what, but everything is a truth. Yeah, yeah, um, Rob Smith, I'm taking a wait and see approach when it comes on to, I believe you're still kind of referencing the Whisper U20s or seniors or whatever. Um, I'm not sure how it's going to go. I know the narrative is, boy, him above it, him above it. But I would love to see him play at his age group level against the best teams in CONCACAF and see if him can get us to the World Cup. And then when we go to the World Cup, I want to see him playing against the best players in the world at his age group in one tournament. And that doesn't mean him can't play for the senior team around those times, but I believe he needs to be on that U20 team if we want to qualify. He's one of our best players at that age group. Dual Rosemary coaches hurts our clubs and national pro Absolutely. Absolutely. But as, as you said, Jan PL fan, I know it's a money thing and you know you have to provide for your family, so... If the, if the way that you can do that better, if you want to do what you love, which is coaching, you might need three, four jobs based on what they pay. <laughs> so, you know, you can't fight them for that. We just need to figure out a way to get. Um, I don't know if it's if the sponsors need to find a way to. I don't know. I don't know what you could do to get the coaching salaries better in Jamaica. It just needs more money in the system, period. Yeah, Martin. So, Carlin is something that I definitely want to add to the channel. I think it will help to, to hear people's take. But for now, just drop your comments in the comment section and me make sure I read them out for you. See? Is Hendrick playing for the Brazil U20? Well, Hendrick did play for the Brazil in the um in the qualifiers for the for the Paris Olympics. He did play with them then. And then he recently played with them with the with the senior team. So he plays with both. I know, I know the Olympics is under twenty three, but the um the Brazil under twenty. Uh, I'm not sure. I think their qualifiers are not done yet. So we'll see if he plays for them. Um, but I, I don't really like to compare players from like the biggest nations what they do with their national teams because it's different. It's different. Like you know, Hendrik, and first of all, Hendrik is an anomaly. Like he's 17 or 17, and he's already a star in the Brazilian Serie A league. Um, you know, I know Whisper is not in the Jamaica Premier League to be a star, so you can't really compare that. But you know, Whisper is playing really well at the U21 in PL2. Um, you know, I think if if Whisper was playing, you know, regularly at Chelsea first team, then the comparison would make more sense. Um, but the levels just aren't the same because the Brazilian uh, Serie A is is a is a higher level than PL two, you know. So, um, yeah, I don't. I I think I know he play. I know he plans on playing in the Olympics, which is under twenty three, um, and he's not bigger than that, you know. Um, and 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 to be totally honest, you know, I want to see Hendrix. With this Hendrick with this first team of Brazil when everybody's fit, you know, because you know Richarlison was on the team but unfit for the last window. Jesus was unfit. Um Martinelli was unfit. There were a lot of players that weren't available. So that could have been a part of the reason why he played so much in the window as well. Not to say he wouldn't get game, but he even started one of the games, I thought. So which was surprising. Martin said, the under-20 coach will always be a local coach to me. I see so much smoke screen with under-20 based on how speed answer the question he's asked. Tough questions I'm talking. Well, I think, I think, I think potentially we could have an under-20 coach 
that's not local. Um, because I do think that speed realizes that 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 break from the under twenties to the to the senior team needs to be that bridge needs to be stronger. We're not developing the players into the senior team. You know, they, they, they go missing for a few years and they might come back or we find some people later down that weren't used in that level, you know? So um, I think he understands that concept. And the, the thing, the key is, you know, will they ever have a budget that would allow to have... Because John Wall's role without the part with the senior team is a necessary role. U20 coach... Head of talent and ID development, head of scouting, you know, for, for, for the certain age groups, like for a certain, you know, time frame of player, 16 to 20, 16 to 21, that type of age. That's a needed role in the JFF. But if you're going to give that same person a role with the senior team as well and a role with, it takes away from that role. So, you know, there are two things, right? I for the, I for the longest have said the positions that, JFF don't have anything with. We don't use them wisely. We have a technical director in Wendell Downswell that is out of touch with systems in football in 2024. I don't care what anybody tell me. That position could be better served with someone with a more technical, um, a grasp of where technical, where technical football is going in the future. Wendell Downswell is a dinosaur when it comes to technical stuff. That's a fact. When I when I was trying to play and be a part of Jamaica setup for the for the for the qualifying for the Olympics when I was in college, you know who did my training session that day? And I'm not a young youth. I know I look young, ladies who watch this back or who are here. I look young, but I'm old. <laughs> Zine? Wendell Downswell was doing that, that session for the two weeks. That's a long time ago, people. Football has changed four or five times since I was training in them sessions. And not to say that him can continue and learn and everything, but I don't think he's learning much, people. I think he's in a position and he has the position and he's had the position and he just keeps to have the position. What has he done in the position? What has he done? He's a technical director, but we heard Speed talking about technical aspects thousand times more than the actual technical director. So is he there? What does he do? What does he do? I wish Travis was here because he would be defending him and telling me what he does. I don't know what he does. When you qualify for this World Cup, I expect JFF to pay all the money they owe so they can have money and stop complaining. I pray. Yeah, I uh, I don't know. They will always find something else that they need to pay for. But yeah, that's that's it, people. Um, Just wanted to put in your mind that the U20 draw will be coming up tomorrow. So we'll be definitely looking out for that, documenting it. I might even do a live and just see how the group pan out. David J said, bless up Jay Guna. What you say? Take off your cap, old man. No, no, no. The gray don't start showing my hair, you know. But just, but just have a whole heap of hair right now. And they look kind of mad when I turn on the stream. So I'm just fling on my cap, you know. Me need a cap for under yes, so if I want to block the gray. Because this is the gray I go. Yeah, man, Martin. Bless up, bro. I've done the show now. Get, get two hours on it. Um, and we'll just uh, chip out now and free up the streets for the rest of the day. You don't know football are starting about an hour or so. Um, I have some championship games. Definitely going to check in with those. See the reggae boys, them. And um, yeah, let's we'll take it from there, people. So definitely going to go live at some point for the rest of this week. Uh, I might wait until after the games tomorrow to do any kind of recap of the games today because I want to go ahead and tie in the Europa and the conference. And then definitely before the weekend, we're going to do an EPL preview show at some point um and as i said i might 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 go live tomorrow either right after the draw just to discuss the groups that have come out or during we can maybe um you know listen along and then talk about it afterwards so 
Yeah, that, that's probably what's going to happen, people. So on the docket moving forward this week, EPL preview show at some point before the weekend. Going to do a, a, a full review, um, not, yeah, full recap review of the, the other two Champions League games, any other reggae boys who might play, and also the Europa and the Conference League games. Cause we, you know, we have teams and players to look for from the reggae boys side in that as well. So... Yeah, full week of games, people. Definitely going to keep bringing you the content, discussions. Um, had a great one today. We discussed the penalty, no penalty. We discussed the handball by Gabriel in the box. We discussed the tactics between the Madrid and the City games and the Arsenal-Bayern games. We went through some of the reggae boys who played in the Championship League One level, watched their races for their promotion, and also um, touched on briefly the U20 and how I feel about the coaching change and what we need to do moving forward to have less of these situations occur where we have one man with 75 different jobs to do in this limited amount of time. So big up everyone that was here to enjoy the show. Big up Martin, big up Shanice. Hey, my friend, how are you? Like the video. I know you just got here late, but you can watch it back. Um, let me see, David J. No, 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 I have Paramount Plus, so I will watch the other one on Paramount Plus probably on my device and I have one on the TV. So, yeah, CBS Paramount Plus, between them two there. John PL fan asking, early prediction for the Villa game. So, um, I had my predictions written down from the other day, and in the Villa game, I went for a Villa 3-2 win at home. I think Villa's defense will be breached. I think Lille will breach them. They they haven't they they they've been leaking goals lately. I don't believe that's gonna stop this this game. So, but I do think that Villa will be able to score as well. So three two to them is what I'm going for. Um, you know, Luis is suspended for the Premier League, so I expect him to be all guns blazing today. McGinn is back. Uh, Morgan Rogers looks to be improving in his role for Ramsey since Ramsey's out for the season. Um, but I think the the crucial thing is gonna be what does he do in partnering Watkins up there because will it be Diaby in the forward role? Will it be Bailey trying to play forward with Diaby wide? Will it be Diaby in the middle, Bailey wide? Will he not go with either one and play Tillemans as the second striker and play Diaby wide or Bailey wide or McGinn wide? So there's a lot of different options he can do, people. I think more than likely um, Bailey starts this one. He usually tends to start the home games in Europe. Um... And early on in the season, he was starting all the games in Europe and benching in the Premier League, but it's kind of been flipped. But they do have the game against Arsenal at the Emirates and in those type of defensive games where he might want a little more out of the wide player, maybe Bailey won't play in the Arsenal game. So I expect him to start today and probably play the entire game if he, if he doesn't get injured. So we'll see what happens, people. But my prediction for the Villa game is 3-2 to Aston Villa. Oh, you meant Arsenal versus Villa. Um, early prediction. I feel like Douglas Lewis not there is gonna kill their midfield. I think he's like the key to how they play. So I believe that Arsenal will beat them on the day. I'll say probably like a two nil. I don't think Villa will even score. Maybe maybe two either two nil or three one. We're gonna win the game by two. That's what me say. And I believe it's going to be down to um, no Douglas Lewis in midfield. They don't have anybody on their team that can replace what him would have bring in that midfield. Shani said, Aston Villa going to win. I hope you mean against Lille in the Europa League, you know, in the Conference League, you know, and not against Arsenal, you know, Shani. I really hope so. Maggie is a good midfielder. Yeah, he's good, he's good, he's good. He's good. Um, man, very. He's a Manning Cup legend, you know. But I don't believe that he tell himself he hasn't kicked on like he should have as a professional. Got the move to Belgium, but didn't really work out for him over there. Didn't play much, and now he's back in the championship and not really cracking the starting lineup regularly for the USL championship team. So 
he's a good midfielder, but you know, I'm sure he'll tell you that he's been a bit disappointed with how his career has panned out so far. Yeah, man, Jampiel. But now I gotta draw out the thing. Bless up, people. Jason Guna again with another live episode. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to the content. And until next time, people, Jason Guna is gone. Bless up on yourself. And we'll be back shortly, people. Big up. Until then, share around the stuff. Like the video. Come on, you gooners. But now I give up on you. Know.